Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Let's Talk Housing. My name is Brennan Thomas, and I am the co-host here alongside Mr. Stephen Thomas, Chief Economist and Founder of Reports on Housing. Today, we will discuss the most recent news and statistics as usual, housing crash theories, multifamily distress, the mansion tax, and much more. But first, Stephen, what is happening in your jolly life? Ah. Well, uh, this last weekend was so much fun. So on Sunday, uh, Zeke, who is six and is doing a kindergarten at a Montessori, uh, they, they had a ducks night and they said, do you want to buy any tickets? So I bought tons of tickets and all, uh, there was eight out of the nine kids were at this ducks game, uh, with myself and while, um, my beautiful wife stayed at home and just got to relax a little bit without kids around. And it was, it was so much fun being with all my kids. It's one of the favorite things I do is actually watch, watch hockey and to watch it with all of the kids all at once. Cause they're all hockey fans. We have lots of ducks gears too bad. They lost, but they were doing really well up until the third period. And then they lost it, but that's been the story of their entire year. They're a really young team. They're fun to watch, but they need to win more so that we can actually go to the playoffs because I like to grow a beard during the playoffs. That's what hockey uh, hockey players do, and I like to pretend I'm a hockey player, so I do it as well. And so that's what we did last week. I still fond memories, and afterwards we went to In-N-Out Burger, and everybody got lots of burgers and all the kids sitting there. Oh, so fun. I'm a lucky dad. That was fun. That we were only missing boss. Michaela, but Michaela was busy with the grand, uh, our, our grandbaby. How about you? What's going on in uh, your neck of the woods over there, Brennan Thomas? Well, I would say for starters, I mean, soccer has been going. I talk about this every single time, but this is, it means that much to me. It's We're doing good right now, Arsenal. Fingers crossed that just, they continue to do well, but uh, I bought tickets to see them this summer because they're coming out to the U.S., and this will be my first time seeing them somehow, even though I've watched them for so long. And... Um, this upcoming week, we're actually going to a concert, you and I. We're going to go see uh, the Paper Kites, which is going to be exciting. Been looking forward to that forever. So I'm, uh, I have a lot to look forward to and just same old for me, but it's all good. So, But Stephen, like usual, what's happening with supply, demand, and our very own expected market time? Yes. Yeah, so uh, demand for all of SoCal combined uh, actually has leveled out. So has the Bay Area. We're also tracking other areas like Sacramento, Phoenix, and Vegas because we will be launching a rep reports there later this year. But uh, demand's kind of like uh, hit a plateau. Usually it continues to rise a bit as more homes come on the market all the way until it peaks sometime between uh, uh, around April to the end of May. But we're kind of getting this uh, where it's kind of a flat line. We probably will go up a little bit more because I, we anticipate interest rates to come down. But because interest rates went north of 7% with no points, we're actually seeing it eat into demand. 7% is a giant psychological barrier for uh, pretty much the market. It, it precludes homeowners from placing their homes on the market. And also it precludes some buyers from purchasing because it has a, a seven handle on it. And it's getting to the point where fewer and fewer uh, buyers can actually uh, afford to purchase. So uh, we're seeing a slight downtrend in uh, demand. We're seeing a slight, in many, many markets, a slight uptick in inventory. And as a result, expect a market times. So that's if you place your home in the market. When you open up escrow, we do that based upon supply and demand. And uh, it's actually inched up a tiny bit and not anything gigantic, but it would be going down right now. And we would have demand going up and inventory levels actually going down a little bit if we had interest rates south of 7%. But since they've risen above that, that's what's going on right now. And we're seeing it in all markets. I have real estate agents going, but... We're getting multiple offers. I'm talking about uh, that's normal for entry-level ranges in some cities. 
But overall, what, what you have to take a look at is what's, it, what's the overall county doing? And we can see it in the numbers. It's very reminiscent of last year. It's just a little bit cooler than last year, barely. You wouldn't be able to tell if you were working in the trenches. However, we can see it in the numbers. And we could see the uh, vacillation in the numbers based upon where rates are. But you can't really feel it. If you're looking for along the coast here, seven fifty to a million dollars for a detached house. That is on fire. Good luck finding anything. You're going to be dealing with upwards of 10, 15, 20 offers when a nice property comes on, and that's normal. So, uh, but that that's not, I'm looking at the general market as a whole, and we're looking at the number of pending sales that are opening up, and it's, it's kind of like plateaued, like I said. So that's what's going on right now in housing. So as far as the economy goes, um, what economic releases have we seen recently? So we're uh, we, the Fed is so data dependent that uh, the bond traders. That's uh, so bond traders as well as Wall Street. They're looking at almost every single data point, trying to figure out how the Fed's going to respond to something. And now they've actually they've taken it to a new level where they're they're responding to uh, a ton of data, like initial unemployment claims rose uh, like twelve thousand from week to week, and all of a sudden that moved the markets. It doesn't usually move the markets that much, but it, right now it is because we have these, there's not a lot of, of data that's been going on over the last couple of weeks. We uh, did get, uh, we, we did get uh, PCE on the, on leap day yesterday. That's uh, personal consumption expenditure. And that actually uh it's coming in nicely you look at the month the month the month the month was actually up but that happens every once in a while it's squirrely in the numbers same thing happened with cpi but if you look at overall year over year it's coming down nicely it looks fine it's exactly the way i still see cpi is looking fine but uh, you get wall street's different reactions based upon this today we had uh global manufacturing pmi it's manufacturing the, the numbers actually came in uh, nice. What we saw is interest rates actually come down a little bit today and uh, because the numbers jived. And we're so data dependent that we're waiting for the big numbers to change. We're actually looking at CPI to change. We're seeing jobs next week. We have Jobs Friday. That's important. This thing was going to drop on Wednesday. We're going to get jobs a couple days after that. We, uh, job, uh, job openings will be towards the beginning of the week. So by the time you're listening to this, job openings for the month of February were all already be baked in. And these are different things that can move the markets a lot more than these little things, because this is really what the Fed is concerned about, jobs and inflation. And that's their, their biggest concern. I think overall, as we progress in this year, it's going to do exactly what the Fed wants to do. And they're going to wait too long is, our, is what we guess at this, at this point, because we feel that they should already make a change, because uh, the longer they wait, the more damage they're going to control, they're going to cause, just like when they uh, waited on transitory. They knew it was no longer transitory, but they waited probably an additional six to nine months, depending upon who you believe. Uh, but we knew as, as early as the, the summer, so nine months later is when they made the first rate hike. They should have done it almost immediately. So they waited longer, caused more damage by keeping interest rates down lower and still buying bonds and uh, mortgage-backed securities, which flooded the market and continued to juice something that didn't need juiced back then. So I'm not, we're worried that they're going to make the same mistake and not cut soon enough. And it looks like they're going to cut, wait all the way till June. They should have done it in January. They're not going to do it in March. They're not going to do it in May. We think it's going to happen in June. Wait beyond with June. With these economic re releases, uh, what has happened with rate volatility recently? Yeah, it's, it's all over the, it's like zigzag, but we've been kind of like, Lately, we've been stuck right at around 7%. It goes up for a day, comes down and comes up and down. It's just this vacillation based upon these numbers that don't usually move the market as much, but they're starved for data. So it's moving the market up and down, up and down because uh, it, these the different charts that they're actually looking at do have more volatility in them. And it's not the trends that that the uh, that we're really looking into. There's way uh, there's way more important trends to follow inflation. Like I said, jobs, there's other things such as uh, how much consumption is going on uh, out there because that's big 
big part of GDP, as well as how, what's credit card debt look like? What, what do, do uh, deep, uh, defaults look like on credit card debt, as well as automobile loans? Those are spiking. What's the savings rate look like? How much excess savings is left? Those are the things that I think are very important that uh, we're getting some people ignoring the most important stuff and reacting to the little stuff. So I wanted to ask you, with today's pricing for real estate in general and demand, are we looking at a new normal following COVID? Because obviously, before COVID, it was sort of the same trajectory. However, things seem to be altered very quickly. So what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, prior to COVID, it was methodical. From 2012 through 2019, it was like up about 5% per annum. Uh, you know, four to five percent, and some markets less, some markets a little bit more. But it was this methodical grind that we were doing. And then along came COVID, and we got these spikes. We're not really getting the spikes right now, and this that's because of unaffordability. We still have the, the the same problem that we had before. When you look at supply and demand, the supply that we had even prior to COVID was low, and it got lower and lower and lower over time. However, it, uh, COVID made things worse. We haven't been able to climb out of that basement. So supply is even worse than where we were prior to COVID. And so which is why we have more of an issue. The number of available homes is so low that if we have interest rates that drop, it's matched up against this low inventory and it just creates too much heat in the market. And that's then what we dealt with in in uh, the second half of 2020, all of 2021, and the first half of 2022, when interest rates were still reasonable for the first half of 2022, we got a lot of juice and it was too much. They had very little supply. Supply drilled down even to the lowest levels that we'd ever seen in 2022 to start. And it was matched with these uh, low rates that just ignited way too much demand and there's nothing to sell. So you had you had values screaming higher. Right now, because of interest rates being as high as they are, it's it is offsetting this low, low inventory. So you have this slug, uh, this slug fest that's been going on. This bout is heavyweights. The heavyweight being low inventory is throwing punches, which which uh, favors the uh, the seller side of the equation in negotiations. But you have this low demand because of a home affordability, home affordability being so bad that it favors the buyer side of the equation in negotiations. So they've been duking it out. And what happens is as interest rates float above 7%, it becomes more of a wash. We don't get as much uh, heat on rates going uh, on, on appreciation. But what we really see, so 7% is that big threshold. Right below that is 6%. 6% is a big threshold where if we get below 6%, it's going to be off to crazy train again. That's another psychological barrier. And people go, how can we get there? If you re we're at 7% right now. If you can remember back in October, just a few months ago, we were at 8%. We're at 7% right now. If we're at 7% and we have the economy cool down a bit, yes, sorry, Bob, we can get below 6%. And you pay points, you're definitely below 6%. That's going to create a lot of heat. And we're going to see appreciation continue to march upward unless we miraculously get inventory from under some rock because that's been the problem. Now, Stephen, I know you are going to love this next part of the podcast, but I want to get into some crash theories. One could call this a real estate crash, crash course, and with real answers. So to start, Stephen, if you could describe the premise of each and if any or none are just valid in general. So I wanted to start by asking you about the Airbnb bust, since there's always a lot of conversation on this in recent times. Yeah, this was all started on Twitter. A lot of this junk is started on Twitter. And then people look for something, try to make content on YouTube. And then, of course, there's other social media. But this is really where the launching platform is. And really, a lot of this the, is, is starts at Twitter. And, and matter of fact, uh, newspaper articles and the magazine articles and different uh, publications on the Internet uh, drive some of their ideas from the Internet. And then they go from there. So that's where Airbnb even began. You got a lot of people that got into the Airbnb space that actually don't have 
a clue on how to really run an Airbnb, like a mini hotel type of thing. You have others that have a whole bunch of Airbnbs. They run it like a business because that's what it ba basically is. So these people that are having a hard time, they're talking about how at the end of the day, they do all this stuff and they do all this work and they're making exactly zero on it. And some people are selling or they're, they're complaining that they're not getting in as many bookings and things like that. And a lot of this has to do with uh, the, the approach. If you're going to have a onesie or a twosie or one over here, one over there, and you don't have uh, a, a bunch and it's not really, it's just like a secondary income type of thing. It takes a lot of work to put it together. And so these are the people that have troubles. Those are the people that complain about it the most and say, it's not what everybody said. There's way too many of us out there. That's not what it is. You can, you can definitely compete. You just have to do it differently and uh, make it sizzle. And uh, I, I've, we've stayed in plenty of Airbnb and VRBOs. And that's basically, these, you, you know which ones, these people, they do it for a living. And they've got a ton of them. And it's really great to stay at these. So and, and then you get stories like in New York City with Airbnbs. Airbnbs uh, could no longer be in New York City, so all the, we're going to shut it down, and now we're going to get a lot of inventory. Well, that didn't happen. You have, there's a black market, according to some people on Twitter, and, there's, uh, and th that the inventory is going to come. A lot of these turned into long-term leases. Well, that should apply a lot more pressure on uh, rents to go down. That's not the case. That's not happening either. It's, it, it really has been absorbed. And who's the biggest winner in this? Hotels. That's, that's who uh, is pushing and lobbying for there to be a crackdown on Airbnbs more than even the neighbors that are affected by these because it makes it more profitable for them not to have Airbnbs that they have to compete with. So, but as far as when you look at the data from AirDNA, it's not affiliated with Airbnb or VRBO. They just take a bunch of data on, on, on it and they know what's going on actually out there and they do metrics for different areas. And it's, it's, they're not hurting. It's not a yellow flag. It's not a red flag. It is, uh, it's doing quite well, Airbnb. So uh, as far as where's this crash coming, I don't know. There's a million of them uh, in total across the United States. Even if all 1 million came uh, about right now, we only have a million homes on the market, bring in at 2 million. That's where we were prior to uh, COVID, about 2 million homes on the market. So it would bring us to an inventory that where we were prior to COVID. But not all 1 million are going to all of a sudden say, hey, you can't do it anymore, and they're all going to come on the market. So I don't know where this crash is coming from. It makes absolutely no sense. It's just, that's, this isn't the angle. You need inventory for there to be crash, and it's definitely not coming from Airbnb. So another one that I've heard is that for those who are seeking those sort of articles or at least a real estate crash, that higher rates could be the answer for that to happen. Um, what's your opinion on that? So why in the world as rates, we already have this, like what they refer to it as a lock in effect, or I call it hunkering down where homeowners take a look at it and they go, well, I'm not moving. I have a 3.2% interest rate. Interest rates are at 9% or 10%. At what point is it all going to, all of a sudden going to make that homeowner move when it's like, uh, it's. 85% of Californians, it's lower than that. I think it's 79% of everybody across the United States with a, with a mortgage have a mortgage locked in at 5% or less. Who in the world is going to move? Why would they move? They would do everything in their power to keep it or rent it out and, and move into a smaller rental or something like that. There's not going to be this flood as rates rise even higher. I just don't see it. What I am seeing is I just did the new home, uh, the number of homes coming on the market right now. And the number of homes coming on the market in January, it was off. Uh, it would, I mean, there was more homes that came on the market January of this year compared to last year. Well, I did this year, Fe February, this year over last year, and it was more, but it wasn't quite as much as it was in, lo in, 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 uh, in January. So that's because rates went up higher, and now some homeowners that would have come on the market had interest rates been in the sixes are saying, you know what, I'll wait. I want rates to come down a little bit more before I make this happen. And as rates fall further, when the economy uh, slows and we get uh, pushed where 10-year treasuries then are bought and they go down, interest rates will go down. We'll get to about 6 to 6.5% 6 in rates. We're going to see more homes come on the market then, and we're going to see more demand. So I just don't see as these where are these higher rates are going to come from. I, we don't see 
it forecasted. We just can't see a, a pathway for it. There's a lot of people that say the Fed doesn't want it. Just like the Fed didn't want too low of rates, which they, they argue against that and they come out and talk about it, they don't want too high of rates. When it got to 8%, they got on their soapboxes and said, too high, too restrictive, we're not gonna let this happen, don't worry. Uh, and then all of a sudden it cooled down the market and you saw that, we saw interest rates float back down to seven, in the sevens, low sevens, and then it dipped all the way down to 6.6% once uh, the Fed spoke in uh, December. So they could easily uh, grab the reins of this and we have rates to come back down. So I don't see the crash coming with higher rates either because the Fed won't allow it. We can't uh, afford to have uh, our giant debt with extra high interest rates either. Uh, that, that won't happen either. Just don't, don't, don't see a pathway to it. So another one is the unemployment skyrocketing could lead to foreclosures and short sales. So we right now have a problem of way too many job openings and very, very historically low uh, uh, unemployment. It doesn't all of a sudden, there's this sea change where all of a sudden everybody's employed, unemployed. That's it. That's, that's the way it happens. And people like hearken to the Great Recession. And there's only two times where we had a major blow in prices, and that was the Great Depression and the Great Recession. And, and uh, so that's where you got uh, more unemployment, and the unemployment was driven by a bunch of different sectors because of what we did in the financial in, uh, industry, as well as the real estate industry, as well as stocks got hammered, and then we had a lot more layoffs, and we had people that lost their homes in foreclosures, there was a lot of bank bankruptcies. There was a lot of mess in the system. We don't have that as a housing stock. It is the strongest housing stock of all time. Not like the Great Depression, not like the Great Recession. You need some real, uh, some, some uh, cross waves in the data where it shows, uh-oh, we have a cautionary tale. We have cautionary yellow flags that are for things to watch, but that's just going to slow down the economy. It's not going to cause a disaster like what we saw during the Great Recession. So, we just don't see a lot of unemployment in any kind of a slowdown scenario. Uh, although that's what some doomers are talking about. I just don't see the pathway for it. But, uh, and I listen to them. Some of them sound extremely smart. But it just doesn't make sense when they do the analysis. I'm scratching my head. You can sound really smart saying things that are incorrect. And it doesn't make them right. It doesn't show in the charts. And it doesn't make sense what they're talking about either. But I can't refute everything that everybody's saying. But that, that's definitely not where we're going to get a crash in housing. Now, this one, uh, we were talking about this before this uh, podcast even started. But the ominous shadow inventory. If you can't see me right now, I'm crossing my eyes. Why am I crossing my eyes? Because this one, it just, it was frustrating to hear it back in 2012, 2013, 2014, 2015. It's like it will never go away. At what point is the shadow inventory all of a sudden going to crash on? They're talking vacancies. They're talking about the number of vacancies. Now, part of this, the all these vacant properties because that's where this shadow inventory is is all these people sitting on vacant properties they can't sit on them forever so they're going to have to unleash them and then when they do there's going to be all this inventory so second homes are treated like uh vacant properties you can't live in two homes and call them both your home unfortunately that's not how it works you have to pick one or the other and when you pick one guess what the other one becomes vacant and there's a lot of people with Second homes. You have a cabin up in the uh, up in uh, the mountains, right around a ski place or something like that. Guess what? Second home. And uh, there's a lot of these kind of scenarios. There are uh, it, when when a property is vacant uh, because it's a rental, and if it's vacant for one month or two months or whatever it is, guess what? Vacancy. So you add up all these vacancies, and it looks oh my gosh, but it's not out of turn. It's just the way the numbers work in the United States. It's, it hasn't really changed. So their little shadow inventory theory, it just 
doesn't exist. There's not going to be a bunch of people that suddenly, all of a sudden, because they say right now, you know, this is the time where we're going to flood the market because I'm finally going to sell so that I can uh, make a pro. I don't know exactly how that works because we've seen values go up so high. You think at one at some point they pull the trigger and say, well, now that my home has doubled in value, I will go ahead and sell. Something would have triggered it. It hasn't triggered it so far. It's not going to be all of a sudden in 2024 for any reason that all of a sudden people are going to place their homes on the market because it's part of this shadow inventory theory that people are talking about. It was a lot of banks. They said banks are sitting on the shadow inventory. That was also part of it. Things that they weren't foreclosing on and stuff like that. That's not true either. It just doesn't exist. Not enough delinquent homes across the United States. Uh, we're at national delinquency rate of all uh, near all time lows, decades lows. So don't. That's not where it's coming from either. So one that I've heard fairly recently due to uh, some of the insurance issues that's been happening, and I guess just climate in general, is climate change in high impact areas could fluctuate pricing and cause some markets to crash. <laughs> yeah, uh, no, uh, there would have been a crash already. Florida is way ahead of California. And it's because of uh, these these uh, insurance companies don't want to they, they don't want to uh, insure in these states because of the bureaucracy of the government and the way that it works. So uh, the way that the way that it works is you have to actually file for a rate adjustment. And you file for a rate adjustment. Well, it takes government so long to get back to them. It's about a year to get back to them. And a lot of times after that year, they say, nope, you can't do the rate adjustment. Well, these insurance companies who've lost it like crazy with all the different hurricanes that have lost it like crazy more recently with the fires have now said that they don't want to have to wait a year for a no because they're not making a profit right now. The only way they can make a profit is by adjusting their, their rates now so that they can have a profit. And since uh, the, these states will not allow them to do that, see you later. I am leaving the state of California most recently. Uh, Florida is way ahead of the curve, and that's why they have their own, own uh, insurance thing, uh, Florida Insurance. California is starting something like that, but it's really ugly right now in Florida, and California is moving that direction. It's like somebody learned something and actually allow them to make a profit, come in here and create more, uh, more opportunities because it's expensive enough to do the California one. We need more than just the state coming in here. We need these uh, other insurance companies to come in and create more supply so that they're competing against each other. And when you have more competition, the prices will be in line. So let's, let's let that capitalistic piece of the United States of America happen in the state of California. Otherwise, we're going to be looking at insurance costs that soar and it will eat into some demand of people that say, I can't afford it, especially at these higher rates. It could slow things down in the future if it continues to go down the path that it's going right now doesn't i mean this is probably going to get solved eventually it's just when is eventually well right now it's a real problem so there's a lot of noise there's a lot of lobbying there's a lot of talk about it why because something needs to happen and it'll eventually push comes to shove something will eventually break and they'll have to fix the issue but it's not going to so cause a, a crash. different one is income being outpaced by pricing to the point where fuel into the market and prices will be forced to drop. Yeah, I just don't understand this one. Uh, this is this logic of my gut tells me it's just too unaffordable. It's so unaffordable that values should just come down. And it's, uh, it's just got to get to a point where after some time, all buyers just dig in their heels and say, I'm not, bu I'm not uh, buying anymore. And collectively, if they all do it together, that all of a sudden we would see uh, values drop. Um, that's not how it works, unfortunately. Buyers want to buy. They're busy. There's millennials that are getting married. They're having babies. They want a house. They're going to do what they can. They're dual income. The people that are buying, there's people that have all cash. They have access to cash. They don't care about these interest rates or they have the dual income where they have so much that, that they make on a monthly basis that they just want to buy. And they have down payments. You're saying, no, they don't. Well, demand's not even that high to begin with because it's matched against very low inventory. So the market's still moving. We're just not doing as many units. So this crash has to come from them, all these people with cash and all this ability to sop up this low inventory uh, to stop. And they stop so that that low inventory can accumulate over time so it's big enough where then... In order to compete, they have to reduce the, the price, and that's where you get value. You have to have too many homes on the market 
market with very little demand for you to get a crash in prices. Well, we've just proven that even with higher rates, that that's not going to happen. We need more inventory. There's many different ways to go about doing it. Governments should get out of their own way. They should get rid of red tape. They should do, uh, be doing more building. They should be doing more with uh, capital gains, exclusions, different things that they can do on the, on the seller side of things, like the supply side of things, to add more to supply. And uh, so uh, that gut feeling that prices should come down because values are, are too high. I just got a, uh, somebody Facebook messaged me today saying just that, that it's just going to happen. It's just going to happen because my gut tells me that that's what's going to happen. And that's just not how ec good economics works. It doesn't go by guts. It goes by exactly what's going on in the trend lines. And the trend lines show what's going on right now. And it's not going to cave based upon these higher rates when rates come down. Inventory levels are still going to be very low, the number of available homes, because they'll be eaten up by the increased demand. So I still don't see where we're going to get all of this inventory from. All right. That was fun, but now I want to change the tune of the podcast. Um, what do you think? Did you like that? <laughs> that, is, that was kind of fun because it's all these things that are constantly hit at me every day. It's like crash, 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 crash. No exactly. Crash. All right. Well, according to Realtor.com, nearly 50% of those polled say that they are willing to take the plunge into home ownership, even if mortgage rates soar above 8%. About 40% of Gen Zers said they'd also buy property at those rates. Could the mentality change stay the same if rates do actually climb again, or would we see another golden handcuff problem on our hands? Yeah, see, part of the issue is uh, you can't have these 8% interest rates and have more inventory, more homes coming on the market. I just, it's, we've already shown that it doesn't. There are more homes that are coming on the market at the start of the year because we had that uh, six to, you know, the, the below 7% threshold. But now that we're above 7%, still there are a few more homeowners coming on the market. That hasn't solved this hunkering down, locked in effect that people feel. feel. It's just that they're tired of waiting. Some people are so tired of waiting, they say, I don't really care. I'll do it anyways. But in order to really move the needle on this, we have to have rates come down even further. So that's where you need for that to happen. A. B, uh, who can afford to buy a house at 8% interest rates? I can show you what happens to affordability channels when you go from seven to eight, five million United States uh, citizens actually can no longer afford a home. And we went from three to 8%. It was just a wash of people across the United States that can no longer afford to purchase a home. So the only way for this really to open up for all these uh, Gen Zers and millennials that are talking about that they would like to be able to purchase, the only way that they can really, really do it uh, and it really opens up is when rates fall. And, and that's, that's what we'll see. So as much as they want to, that just tells me that like everybody uh, typically does, they want to buy. At some point, people want to buy. The average age has gone up higher and higher. It's the first time home buyer average age is 32 years old. It was younger before, but 32 years old right now. And there was this big demographic patch five years in a row. This is the last year, 2024, of all these millennials that are hitting that 32 year uh, age, age uh, bracket and they're ready to buy, but they can't. So what this is, all these millennials that have have been hitting this uh, demographic patch where there are first-time home buyers now have to sit back and wait for rates to come down so they can finally enter in. So while the intention is good, they can't do it with these extra high rates because you'd actually have to have values come down in order for them to do it. And we've already shown that that's not what's going to happen with so many homeowners in such a healthy spot and also enjoying their low rates, not willing to give it up as rates remain high. It's not until rates come down where it frees up more of them to come on the market as well as uh, it, it makes it more affordable for them as well. So since rates are causing payments to increase as they slowly trickle back up, at least to where they have been recently in the lower sevens, um, is now a better time to rent than to purchase if you are outpriced? Uh, so I, my thing is, if you aren't in real estate, you, you really need a piece of real estate to, to get in. 
We've always said every, every I got in this in 1991. Uh, it was uh, different generations ago, you know, but every generation when they start out, nobody wants to buy a condo or a townhome. It's like moving from an apartment to an apartment. It's like, who wants to do that? Well, there's a real, it's a stepping stone to get in something. So you get in to something and then later on down the road, you can get into something more. You trade it in for something extra. So my thing is, if you're in the uh, market to purchase, my thing is purchase now if you really want to. I don't know what your finances look like or anything like that. So, But if you look at your finances and you do the budget and say, yeah, we can do it, but maybe we should hold off. It'll be better in a year from now. The market will be better. That's not what I'm seeing. What I'm seeing is that rates are going to come down uh, down, the, down the road. When exactly they come down, I don't know, but we're thinking that it's uh, going to happen by the time we get to summer. There's a 50% chance that it happens in the spring. Another, it's like 47.5% chance in the spring, 47.5% chance now in the summer. I've kind of changed it before, uh, a little bit from what I said, 50 in the spring, 45 in the summer. But uh, now it's about a 5% chance that it happens in the autumn. I don't think it's going to happen then, but we're going to get the, the economy to slow down, interest rates fall, and, and uh, when that happens, we've already said it. What happens is we will have more homes come on the market, but we're actually going to have even more demand because rates come down. It makes things more affordable. You can buy more home. More people are able to afford a home. So the increase in demand will outpace the increase in supply of homes now coming on the market because rates have come down. So that's uh, so that means that values are going to go up and you're going to be competing even more down the road, which is not really a great thing. We've already experienced that in 2020, 2021, and the first half of 2022. So fairly recently, we've been hearing more chatter about the effects of the mansion tax, which was established in L.A. County. Can you explain the effect it has and if it can spread to other counties across California? Uh, it definitely definitely can spread, but first we have to see how the litigation works out with it's currently uh, in in some litigation. So the city of L.A. It's not L.A. County. It was the city of L.A. and the city of L.A. and the city of Santa Monica have this. Uh, they have different mansion taxes, and if you look at the city of L.A., they they tax any uh, property from five to ten million dollars, and they ta they they tax it one amount, and it's pretty fairly juicy amount. And then can't don't I don't uh, remember it off the top of my head, but then above ten million, it's even higher. So, uh, but what we saw is it went into effect April first of last year. Everybody and their brothers sold their house in March, and uh, it went from like fifty down to three, uh, in for five to ten million, and from uh, ten million plus, it went from like uh, sixteen down to one. It, it was a big giant change, so it was down like fifty percent, uh, right around fifty percent for both both those brackets for the rest of the year, year over year. So while yes, sales were down, they weren't down by half, and that and that continues to be down. And the reason it continues to be down is because they don't want to play with this uh, with this. Uh, this tax and they kind of want to wait to see how the litigation's going. And this could spread to other areas based upon how this litigation goes, because it's like, it's this exorbitant fee. It's gigantic. And it's like picking at the people that are wealthy and saying, well, you're wealthy. Here's the tax pay up because you want to sell your house. And that's, uh, I see the slippery slope in that. And, uh, that's why we're, we're having an issue. And that money was supposed to be earmarked for, uh, to cure the homeless problem, which they already have other homeless things that are on the books and that, uh, they ended up making less because it was down by 50%. And then now they're going to use the money to, uh, actually, uh, pay for the litigation that's taking place, which is why everybody's watching them around California, but they're waiting because they want to see how it all works out. And uh, finally, I want to talk about recently, we've also seen some distress in the multifamily market. Would you mind explaining what's happening? Yeah, so uh, with the multifamily uh, area, it, it, you've actually seen vacancies uh, climb a bit. And it's just climbing back up towards normal levels because there was a point where there was like no vacancies. There was so many uh, apartment complexes that were built across the United States too. So now we're flooding the market with inventory. At the same time, a lot of these, uh, you know, they, they have to get these commercial loans. They don't get a 30 year fixed and then there it's paid off and then it's all good. And they have to get, and then, uh, 
then it's paid off after those 30 years. That's not how it works. It's usually a fixed term and then they have to go get financing. So if they get fixed, a, they have this fixed term and then they have to finance it. Uh, they had it locked in at a low rate. Now they got to finance it at a higher rate. Now all of a sudden it's, now they're paying this giant monthly sum and for some uh, apartment complexes, uh, multifamily, they can't afford it. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't pencil out there. It's going to get, it's ugly. They say, forget it. And they walk away from it. They don't want to, they don't, they don't want to be bleeding on a monthly basis. They want it to be profitable uh, venture. So they're walking and giving it to the bank. And that is why all of a sudden we're seeing a pretty ugly spike in the multi-family uh, market for distress. And we knew this was coming, and that has a lot to do with where rates are, as well as a normalization of the market with higher uh, vacancy, as well as more supply hitting the market all at the same time. Awesome. Well, thank you everyone again for tuning into another episode of Let's Talk Housing. If you want to learn more about what's going on in the real estate industry, please go check out our YouTube. We've got some amazing stuff over there. It's Reports on Housing is our name. And then you can also head to our website and subscribe at reportsonhousing.com. So please leave us a good review. We would greatly appreciate it. And if you have any questions at all, leave it on any of our social media handles or you can also email me at info at reportsonhousing.com. We will see you soon and thank you very much. Thank you.